So we were talking about muscle movement, and we had talked um, about this unit of the muscle called the motor unit, one nerve, multiple muscle fibers. And when that nerve is activated, all of those muscle fibers go through complete contraction. So let's put this principle to use to generate muscle tension. So this is going to be, this term here, tension, is just simply force generated by a muscle. And there are going to be three factors that will dictate the type of tension, the overall tension that the muscle can produce. So what I'm saying is, if I go and lift up a fork, I'm going to use a certain amount of tension. If I go and lift a 50-pound dumbbell, I'm going to use a completely different amount of tension. So how do I go from those similar movements to the vastly different amounts of tension that are required to complete both tasks. And there are going to be three factors that will dictate the tension that can be generated. That's going to be, or one of the factors I should say, is going to be the number of cells per motor unit. And this, this value here, this ratio of the number of cells that we find in a motor unit, remember motor units, one neuron, multiple cells. And so not all of them are going to be created equal. In fact, there's going to be differences that we see uh, in a variety of different types of muscles. So some muscles are going to have thousands of cells in a motor unit. Other muscles may only have five cells in a motor unit. And it dictates a completely different level of control for each of those muscles. So really high number places like your quadricep, where it's usually a, a, a larger motion, such as walking or jumping. Five cells per motor unit are going to be found in the, the muscles that we have connected to our eyes that help us to, to move our eyes and move our head. So we want to have much finer motor control over that, that fine movement compared to our quadriceps. The second factor that will dictate the uh, amount of tension that's produced is going to be the number of individual motor units that are active. So for larger tension, I'm going to activate more individual motor units. For the smaller tension, such as lifting a fork, I'm going to activate a much smaller number of motor units. Then the last factor that dictates the amount of tension is going to actually be related to the nerve. And it's going to be the number of nerve impulses that are sent to the cell. So if I send one signal down in a second, that's going to cause a small little twitch. But if I send five signals down in a second, those twitches are going to begin to build on top of each other. And the little tiny amount of tension that's produced by one tip twitch is added to that next small amount of tension, and it increases the overall tension that's going to be generated. Now, using these three different factors, We need to also apply this thing called the all or none principle. And that principle states that motor units always contract completely. Okay, so this idea that the motor unit always contracts completely. So this purple motor unit here, if that signal is generated to make those purple muscle cells go through their shortening, they will shorten completely every single time. So there's not like a little half contraction, and then sometimes it's a big full contraction. It's always a complete full contraction. If it's signaled to, to contract, it's going to contract completely. That general principle is the all or none principle. So the all or none principle. It's either all in or not at all. 
that complete contraction of a motor unit forms as a twitch. Okay? So every time you activate a muscle with one nerve impulse, it's just a little twitch. Kind of think about that as just kind of a, a, a impulse. Okay? So I take those twitches and I start to bundle them together for multiple motor units. And now I can begin to develop that gross muscle movement of, in this case, uh, elbow flexion. Now, even though when you go through a process of decreasing a joint, such as elbow flexion here, that generates tension. Even when you are in this relaxed position and you're not flexing that muscle, there's still actually activity in the muscle. The individual muscle motor units twitch and contract constantly. So really the picture that I'm trying to build here is you have this sort of underlying muscle tension that's created all the time. Then when you go to go through some sort of task such as flexing the elbow, you have multiple motor units that begin to twitch and you put all those twitches together and it creates that gross motor movement. So you have this underlying tension that's created and then to move the muscle to get all of these twitches added together to, to cause the muscle to move. The underlying tension that's created by this constant twitching of individual motor units is called muscle tension, uh, underlying tension or muscle tone. So we form this underlying tension or this thing called muscle tone. So muscle tone is always there, but then if I want to begin to move my muscle, I need to begin to simulate twitch of these motor units to accomplish the task. Now this underlying tension, what we call muscle tone, remember the sarcomere, right? So if we go back to that molecular level, there's my sarcomere, here are my myosin filaments, got my actin and my thin filaments here, and this whole thing is going to shorten. If I allow the muscle to become too big, let's take a look at this, I eliminate that overlap between the myosin and the actin. Now the myosin has nothing to grab onto, and so if I tried to stimulate a muscle that was in this condition, I wouldn't be able to contract them at all, right? So I try to keep all of my sarcomeres in the resting muscle in this optimal length. So when I need them, when I start to add my twitches in to go through my muscle contraction, I actually have myosin and actin interactions that can occur. Does that make sense? So I try to keep it at this optimal length and it's that muscle tension or muscle underlying muscle tension or what we call muscle tone that helps to achieve that task. So I always have a muscle that's ready to go through a contraction, and it can go through a full strength contraction at any time. So kind of the next step here from the muscle tension is to use those twitches to create work when, when that, or, or I'm sorry, uh, tension when that muscle is needed for work. So when the muscle is needed for work, remember we're kind of starting from this point where we have that underlying tension where there's these individual little kind of twitches that keep all of the sarcomeres in that optimal length. Now the muscle is needed for work, and let's say that I'm going to lift up my fork to see myself a pain at this point. I don't want a lot of muscle tension to be produced. Obviously, I need more than what's being generated from my muscle tone, because right now, muscle tone is happening. There's no change in the shape of this muscle. 
So now I have to go through that process. So now the, the muscles need for work, but it's a very low amount. It's not the same as I'm trying to lift the big thumb up. So we're going to begin to recruit motor units. So more motor units are going to be activated. And we call that recruitment. So when the muscle is needed for work, it goes to motor unit recruitment. Someone remind me real quick what's a motor unit? What are not multiple muscles? So when I recruit a motor unit, I'm activating that neuron, which causes those muscle cells to begin to shorten. What would happen if I increase the number of motor units that are recruited? So the number of motor units that have just been recruited, what's going to happen in terms of force production? So I'm activating more motor units. More cells are contracting through that all or none principle. So more force. And as long as that more force is above the underlying muscle tone, I'm going to begin to have muscle work that occurs. Because see, the underlying tone doesn't really do work besides keeping the sarcomere at the optimal length. It's not that you, you're not seeing them constantly twitching because of that underlying tone. It's just inherent in there, keeping those sarcomere at the right length. And then when we recruit motor units to do work is when we begin to generate the force that is exhibited as a change in joint angle or as, as work. All right, so um, I can activate one time all of my motor units, and I might get a little twitch. What if I want to generate a really smooth motion? So one twitch and a little bit of movement. If I want to have that constant movement, maybe I'm lifting weights or I'm feeding myself. How do I accomplish that task? We know that one motor impulse above threshold or above ten, uh, above muscle tone is going to cause this kind of a little twitch. If I want to have more of that gross motor. I'm going to alter my nerve impulse frequency. And we can actually measure the nerve impulse frequency and how it relates to the generation of force. We have an experimental, uh, an experimental setup that we can do where we can actually <coughs> keep track of the number of pulses. We can alter how quickly those pulses are coming in. Basically, what we do is we take electrodes. You can put them either on the surface, or in some cases, you actually stick them in through the skin, in contact with the nerve or the muscle itself, and you can shock your friends. Good times we're had by all. So you put those electrodes up on a specific muscle, and you use a computer or some other analog device to control how much uh, how much impulse is going to be. Uh, what's going to be the size? There we go. What's going to be the amplitude of the impulse, and how quickly those pulses will come in? Are you going to give them one, or are you going to give them ten over a five-second period? Is it going to be seventy millivolts, or is it going to be a whole volt? So you can alter all of those characteristics, and you can look at the response of the muscle, and maybe even give them uh, some sort of device where you can generate uh, uh, measure the force that's generated. So when we do this, when we change up the nerve frequency, or we put that control over activating individual motor units and activating muscles, when we give just a single impulse, what we observe, just a little small amount of tension is generated. By the way, we can also do this experimentally with animals where we actually track out the muscle. We actually do this here to turn it uh, in our uh, AMD lab, like Sarkoff draws muscle, put it on a strain A or strain user, and we'll simulate it. And we'll change how we simulate that uh, 
how he's going to make that decision that changes how much force he's going to go with the direction actually build this finger up here. So with a single impulse, which is what you're looking at here, here's our nerve impulse called action potentials. And you can see I got a single impulse here. And two impulses that are relatively close together, multiple impulses relatively close together, and then many impulses right on top of each other. And you can see that it changes how the tension is going to be generated, what that tension looks like. So from a single impulse from the physiological side of things, to get this little lift here, I have to have the sarcomere go through a short that's what you're that's what you're measuring is the sarcomere going through a short beat to generate the tension. How do I charge the sarcomere so that it can go through that short basically what I'm asking is how do I create a situation where the myosin heads can find out to impact them all? And there's one eye on that you gotta remember. It's a one word answer. I gotta get high levels of calcium inside of the second. So when you give that impulse, whether it's from the nerve or it's from the experimental, the experimenter's probe, in that muscle you cause calcium to flood into the cell. And this leads towards a muscle going through contraction, which is always going to generate force. Now, if we actually look at that single impulse, and we look at it in high enough detail, I'm going to draw this real quick. What we will actually see, that's our little impulse there, where the stimulus comes in, there's a small little section where there's no apparent increase in tension. It takes a millisecond, and then you begin to see the tension. So the impulse comes in, and there's this small little spot of time called the latent period. That latent period is going to relate to the time for those calcium channels in both the cell membrane and the sarcoplasmic reticulum's membrane to open up. They don't just open up instantaneously. They open up relatively quick, but it takes time for them to open. It's like fire to go over here to the door. Just because I touch the door doesn't mean that I instantly can leave, right? I have to open it up, and it's going to take a small amount of time for it to fly up before I can actually step out of the room, right? So the calcium channel has to open up enough where those calcium molecules can begin to permeate into, into the cell. So we're going to have this time for the calcium channels to open up. Again, we call that the latent period. During that latent period, there's really no contraction, no force that's being generated. It's just a really, really small amount of time. Once we've made it through that latent period, that's when we begin to generate our force. And we can actually, if we have the right experimental setup, measure the force that's being generated. It's from that single impulse, what we're producing is called a muscle twitch. And it's just those muscle cells, all the sarcomeres lined up in that muscle cell, they get activated and they shorten. And it's a twitch. Question? No? Just very surprised. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> when muscle force increases, that's a part of the cycle, which is this first part of the curve. From here up to here. That part of the curve is called muscle contraction. So when the muscle undergoes shortening, generates force, it's called contraction. On the other side, you're actually decreasing the force in this muscle stretch. <laughs> And we call that relaxation. Now, do not confuse relaxation with relengthening the muscle. This particular group of cells that have just been stimulated, 
by this individual single nerve impulse. They've shortened and they've created tension. They've now relaxed and they're no longer generating tension because you no longer have that bias and active filament interaction, but they have not relinked. They actually remain short. Just like when I move my bicep here, I'm no longer contracting my bicep. So there's no longer that tension that's being produced other than my muscle tone. But the sarcomere are still short. They don't lengthen until I contract the antagonistic muscle to that synergist muscle. Okay, so that's our single impulse. Now what about two impulses? So we bring in two nerve impulses. And we're going to dissect this by looking at each impulse alone. So the first nerve impulse. So now we're looking at this example here. That first nerve impulse comes in. Again, same thing happens. We have calcium that floods the cell. So calcium is now flooding the cell. Then we're going to get our twitch. So really, that first impulse is like the single impulse. But then we have our second impulse. So instead of just sending a single impulse <coughs> into the muscles or our external setup, or sending a single single impulse down the nerve, a second impulse comes in. Now, when that second impulse comes in, <coughs> If it happens that it comes in a distance away that the first impulse has already been allowed to fully relax, I'm just going to get another impulse that looks identical to the single impulse. Basically what I'm saying is at that point, the impulses are far enough apart that we just consider them to be single impulses. In this case, if we have that second impulse and it comes in close enough that the tension has not fully resided, uh, is not fully reduced. A second twitch happens. Now that twitch is actually identical, but notice that its starting point is where the first twitch's tension has left off. So you actually get a much larger amount of tension being generated from that same motor. So we result with our muscle contraction being maintained. We don't ever fully relax, which they've drawn in a dotted line here showing that relaxation. We're now contracting again, or we're twitching again, generates more force. So we prevent that relaxation with that second impulse. Calcium enters the muscle cell. It remains in the muscle cell for a prolonged period of time. That means more of the sarcomere can be involved in going through the shortening. The muscle twitches again. And that dual impulse is recorded as a higher amount of tension that's now been generated by that muscle. This idea here where I take a single twitch and I add a second twitch on top is called summation, which makes sense, right? Because I'm adding two twitches together, so I'm summing them together to get a much higher amount of muscle tension being generated. So we call that summation. Now, there will be an upper limit, and you can see here if I have four impulses that come in about the same distance as just those two, I get summation that leads to even higher amount of tension that's being carried. Eventually, we have to run out of tension that can be generated from motor. It's not going to be able to produce an infinity amount of tension. So we do have an upper limit. So in that upper limit, see that we're bringing in many impulses and they're really close together. 
right? So I got two, four, six, eight, ten, ten impulses coming in in a relatively short amount of time. Maybe we call it over a one second time. And just for sake of our. So when I have many impulses that come in in sequence, I basically move this sort of sawtooth pattern. Everything gets shifted over, and so I never have any relaxation that occurs, and it just looks like a straight line. It basically is taking this upward uh, linear portion of this curve and attaching it to the next, attaching it to the next. So you end up with a very straight line as the tension is being built. But we eventually get to a place where no more tension can be generated. We've totally tapped out that, that particular motor unit. And so the, the, the weight increases to the upper limit. And then as long as the contraction is still occurring, as long as impulses are still coming in and the muscle remains contracted, you've reached your maximum amount of tension that can be generated, which is what's represented here at the very top of the curve. This, flat line or what we would call the plateau curve. So with these first impulses, we still have that summation that's happening. It's just it's happening basically right on top of each other, never having relaxation. We get that very nice linear line. So our twitch strength in some, we still have summation. It's just the curve takes on a little bit different appearance here because of the uh, strength of the strength of the muscle tension being produced. It takes on a very smooth curve appearance. So the force curve is this very smooth appearance rather than the kind of sawtooth appearance. That Smooth appearance leading to our plateau is called tetanization. And you've maybe heard of tetanus before. Anyone know what tetanus causes? It's a condition called lockjaw, where the muscle goes into tetanus. It's tetanized. And it, it basically is constantly contracting and your jaw gets locked in the voice and then can't move. Now this idea of tetanization can be put to use. Obviously it's adverse if it's caused by or is generated in lockjaw. But when you're lifting a really, really big weight, you're gonna tetanize your motor foot. So you don't move that way. You get up to a maximum amount of force that's going to be reached in each of those motor units. And no matter what you do, no further effect, no further force can be generated. If you lift weights, hopefully, you don't reach complete technique across all of your motor units. That is everything for the first exam. Up to this point right here. So we're going to continue on. Because I really got all the notes in there. Substance, yes. So this is physiological system three, skeletal, muscle, and now respiratory. Okay, so the respiratory system is made up of four different 
And when you think of aspired vertices, then you probably think, okay, fine, it's the same thing for breathing. Breathing is actually only one of the four processes. So breathing, or what we more appropriately call ventilation, is one of the four processes. And this is the idea that we have air that goes into the lungs and air that comes out of the lungs. Now, if we were to look at the gas components of the air coming in and the air coming out, we're going to find that they are very different. And we're actually going to be able to measure the difference in the amount of oxygen that was extracted by the organism in the amount of CO2 that's being produced. You basically have in the air coming in a high amount of oxygen, the air coming back out a low amount of oxygen. And that relates to the amount of oxygen that was removed by the other three processes from the air that you ventilated into the lungs. On the other side, the CO2 that's out here in the environment is really, really low. In fact, there's very barely any CO2 in the air out here. But when you breathe back out, there's actually high amount of CO2 that comes back out in the air that you breathe out. And that's related to the amount of CO2 that the organism is producing to put it in the air that's breathed back out as waste product. So that's going to be ventilation, this idea of air coming in, bringing oxygen into the lungs, and then the carbon dioxide coming back out, air coming back out. The other three processes, well, first of all, this first process is centered around the anatomy and the physiology of the lungs. The other three processes are actually going to be primarily due to the physiology of the bloodstream, the exercise of the tissue, and the exercise of the fluid, and the tissue itself. So the next process is called external respiration. External respiration is this idea of gas exchange. And when I say gas, I'm talking about things like oxygen and carbon dioxide, which are in a gas form in living temperatures. And we have their external respiration. Movement of oxygen from the lung into the bloodstream and movement of carbon dioxide from the bloodstream back into the lungs. Blood is going to circulate away from the lungs and it's going to go to uh, what's called the general circuit. Eventually makes its way into the, the circulation that goes absolutely everywhere. And we're going to make our way down to um, down to tissue. So this is our blood, here is our tissue, there's one of our cells. The next process is internal respiration, which is moving the gases in both directions, from the blood to the cell, and from the cell back to the blood. Oxygen goes in, CO2 comes back out. So internal respiration is going to be, again, a gas exchange process. from to or from the blood to the tissue. So exchanging gas from the blood to the tissue, from the blood to the cells. Oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide comes back out. The fourth and final process is what occurs inside of the cell. And so we refer to that as cellular respiration. And we've actually already talked about cellular respiration. We talked about cellular respiration when we were discussing producing ATP to help supply that ATP to muscle production. Cellular respiration is a series of chemical reactions that takes glucose at one side of the chemical reaction, breaks it down, reorganizes the electrons to generate ATP. In order for that whole process to work, I have to have oxygen present. Basically, the whole big equation for cellular respiration is to use glucose, C6H12O6, 
in the presence of oxygen to generate carbon dioxide and water. And we actually see this process occurring not only in the biological system, but all over the place. In fact, if I were to take a marshmallow, it's one of my favorite examples, this is a marshmallow. Right? You put a marshmallow here on the table, and this chemical reaction begins. Because there's oxygen here in the air, the marshmallow is just simply glucose. The CO2, I'm sorry, the, um, the glucose in the presence of oxygen is, is being decomposed into carbon dioxide and water. But you can't see it, right? Why can't you see it? It's way too slow. This process becomes much faster inside of a cell because we have enzymes <coughs> that help to catalyze the reaction, which is one of the ways that we can speed up a chemical reaction. What's another way that I can speed up this chemical reaction so we actually can see it? I've got my marshmallow just sitting here. Brandy knows what I'm doing. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. So I've got marshmallow sitting on the table. If I want to break that marshmallow down into CO2, get into water, in the presence of oxygen, you know what I need to do? What's another way to speed up a chemical reaction? Heat. What's the best form of heat for a marshmallow? Can't fire. <laughs> so you begin to roast that thing up, and as soon as it lights on fire, most people are like, oh, dang it, it's on fire. It's actually not on fire. The fire is being produced because the chemical reaction is so exothermic, giving off so much heat that it's producing flames as that carbon dioxide and water is being generated. If I were just leave the marshmallow on the table, it would take probably a thousand years for it to break down. Put it in the fire, speed up the molecule, the molecular movement so that the carbon dioxide and the oxygen collide to go through that chemical reaction collide more frequently we begin to cause that chemical reaction to occur. So inside the cell, you can't just crank up the heat, right? Like that, for heat. So we use enzymes. And we use a series of enzymes. There are 10 steps in this thing called glycolysis, eight steps in this thing called the Krebs cycle, and then this whole chain of enzymes called the electron transport chain. And those 18 steps plus the electron transport chain is what actually takes the glucose molecule interacts with the oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, and in the whole process, I can use the energy that's coming out to generate my mouth heat. That's like the respiration rate of the smallest, tiniest nutshell that you will ever see. By the way, notice CO2 is produced, oxygen is consumed. So, back up to respiration, oxygen is always being depleted by the cells. It's always being converted into CO2 and water. Carbon dioxide is always being increased in the cells. This is a toxin. We don't want to leave CO2 at high levels. So, if we go from lungs over to the cells, my oxygen is high here my oxygen is continually being reduced here. It's being decreased in its concentration. Notice, high to low. Anyone know what that sounds like? High concentration of a molecule, low concentration of a molecule. This is a concentration gradient that favors the movement of oxygen into the cell. It's high out here in the environment. It's continually being decreased in concentration inside of our cells. So oxygen favors to be moved into the cell. On the other side, CO2 is constantly increasing. Out here, CO2 is extremely low. So it favors the movement of CO2 out of the cells in the atmosphere. So the respiratory system, the anatomy has become very, very critical in being able to handle the physiological requirements that are that are needed here. 
And really, when we look at the respiratory system, we really focus on the lungs and all of these tubes and chambers that help in the ventilation process. Once oxygen is moved into the bloodstream, we'll talk a little bit about that transportation process, but really, you're just kind of using that oxygen flowing through the vasculature to move it into the cells. So the most important part here from the system anatomy is the lung and all the tubes and cavities that make up the primary organs of respiration. So the summary of the system anatomy is that we have a bunch of tubes to move air from out here in the environment into the lungs. And we're going to go deep inside of the lungs into this tissue here. We're going to find out that that's called the alveoli, and we literally have thousands and thousands and millions of alveoli inside of our lungs that are little um, sac-like structures where we deposit, when we breathe in, we deposit those gases yes, from the external environment, and then we pick up the CO2 from the blood, and we deposit the alveoli, and we can move it back out whenever we breathe. So these tubes that move air into the lungs and move air back out of the lungs, these tubes are divided up into two divisions. And my guess is that you're probably familiar with the two divisions because you know if you have a little bit of a cold, you have an upper respiratory tract infection. And you may know that if you get a little bit of pneumonia, you have a lower respiratory tract infection. So those are our two divisions, basically from here up and from here down. So we'll start with the upper portion. Which is primarily what you have in your head and your neck. There are cavities here, and then there's a uh, point of convergence, a tube of convergence between these two different cavities that we find in the nasal and the oral regions of the head. So our upper respiratory tract includes our nose, and then inside of the nose you have the navel cavity. Also going to include the mouth, and then inside the mouth where your tongue and teeth are, it's called the oral cavity. So you have the nose and the nasal cavity, and then you have the mouth and the oral cavity, and they converge on this tube back here behind both the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. So there's an opening out of the uh, oral cavity, there's a uh, passageway in from the nasal cavity, and that tube is called the pharynx. And this is going to be our cavity of convergence. Now, as it's labeled here on the figure, and what you better know this pharynx as, it's also called throat. So this is actually going to be upper respiratory tract here. The larynx, or the voice box, is that division between upper and lower. So we're going to get to this portion and what's below that here in just a second. We're going to finish up the upper respiratory tract first with some purposes. So when we look at the nose and the nasal cavity, there are some respiratory functions and then there are some extra respiratory functions. In the nose you have receptors for smell. Which, by the way, anyone have any idea why we need to smell sound? Yeah, it's actually digestive function. And there's nothing better than smelling great food when you're consuming food. It's a pleasurable, awesome experience. You get a cold and it kind of blocks the nose a little bit and you can't feel too good of the smell. Even the most tasty uh, hamburger doesn't really have that good flavor. So it's very, very important for that drive to consume 
But it's also really important because if it smells rancid, if it smells rancid, you probably shouldn't eat it because it's probably got a bunch of things that are going to be the same. So we need that smell for more of a digestive purpose rather than for respiration. The nose also has small guard hairs that act as a filter. The air that you breathe, up here it's pretty clean in White County, Georgia. There are some places where you can go, perhaps Los Angeles in the middle of summer in the morning, that's really, really dense with particulates in the air. And these garden hairs are going to help to filter that air as you breathe it in. It's going to trap that gunk that's in the air. The nose is also going to add moisture. That becomes critically important because the air out here is much drier than the condition of your cells. And you need to maintain the aqueous nature of your cells and surrounding your cells because that's very, very important for biological function. All biology happens in water. Whether it's an organism that lives on land or an organism that lives on water, water is critical. Up to 75% of your total body mass is birth in water. And it basically reduces down to about 60%. Um, maybe it's way down to about 40% older adults. It's still a huge component of water. So the air that we breathe in is comparative to the nature of your body, very dry. So we want to humidify that. We want to add moisture. Also, temperature in here is comfortable, right? But it's actually almost 30 degrees colder here in this room than it is in your internal temperature. And if I just add in air at 70 degrees, I'm going to go hypothermic immediately. So the nose also warms the air and brings the air temperature up closer to almost 100 degrees, 98.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Which is really, really important because that's what the temperature we live at. It's a homeostatic variable that we protect very, very uh, aggressively. The nose is also going to add to your ability to vocalize. We use the nose and the nasal cavity in particular as a resonance device. We resonate the air that we're moving around so that we can actually have a characteristic sound or voice that, that we all have. And that's why it changes a little bit. We can get a little sick. Sound a little nasally. Because you've changed the resonance of the nose so that the voice responds by being changed as well. Now, the pharynx, the purposes of the pharynx, there's a small little cartilaginous flap right here at the base of the pharynx. What is not really well illustrated, but um, you can just make out here, is there's actually two tubes here. You have the tube that leads into the lungs, and then behind it, you have this tube that leads to the stuff called the esophagus. I want to make sure air goes into my lungs and not food, and I want to make sure food goes into my esophagus and not air. So the pharynx is actually going to control when you breathe and make sure air doesn't go down the esophagus, when you eat and make sure food doesn't go down the trachea or down to the, to the lungs. Foods in the esophagus and the air that we breathe in to the trachea. We'll stop there. Uh, on Monday, we'll pick up from the lower side.